very stupidly, had prawns and consequently got food poisoning. And then I went to India and stayed with some friends. And then I went to, to Rome, where I was going to be meeting a friend from England. And when I got off the plane, I know it's never happened before or since, but there was a, on the tannoy, there was a message saying um, my name, and uh, would I go and have a look at the notice board? There was a message for me. So I thought, oh my gosh. Anyway, I went, feeling dreadful, I went to the notice board and there was an envelope with my name on it, and I opened it up. And there was a note um, from Ginny, and I had never met Ginny, and um, she was the person who'd organized, we, we had a mutual friend, and that's the person I was meeting, and Ginny had organized the pensionians, organized everything we were going to do in Rome for the weekend. And, um, but the note said that the, uh, our friend was delayed, and that I'd have to make my own way to the pension because unfortunately, I can't remember what reason it was, she couldn't meet me. And I can't really remember the content of the note, but there was something about what she said that I had never, ever experienced. I'd been born again, I'd been born again in Japan, but I wasn't spirit-filled. And when I read this, I thought, now this person is either not English or she must be a Christian because her love that just exuded from this note was just overwhelming. Anyway, I got there and I met Ginny and I think the first thing that I said to her was, have you got Italian blood or are you a Christian? And you just have to look at Ginny. She, well, she could be Italian, but <laughs> she, she said, actually, I, I'm a Christian. And what I felt was so interesting was her title of her talk tonight is Distinctly Different. And I felt that note was distinctly different to anything I'd ever read or any greeting from a complete stranger I'd ever had. And there must be something really special about this person. And I found that to be true. So I just really want to commend Ginny to you. She means a lot to me and to many people. And she's been instrumental. She, she gave me um, introductions to the church that I went to um, because I said I don't know anybody spiritful and I don't know which church to go to or anything like that. And Ginny introduced me to people and I met my husband at the church. So Ginny, I have a lot to thank you for. So do come and speak. It's a real joy to be here tonight. Um, I grew up uh, in Norfolk, in North Norfolk, in Brancaster State. My parents moved from London and they bought the Johnny Sailors, which is a pub in Brancaster State. It was a tiny little pub at that stage. And um, I remember my father uh, coming home and saying he had bought a home and mum was absolutely thrilled and said I bought a pub and she said oh darling she'd never been into a pub um, but it became the most amazing centre of the village and but both my parents were believers and it was where everyone came and congregated and um, they would pray with people quite regularly and if they couldn't cope they would ring up our vicar and he would come and have a pint and pray with people and I always remember mum was very gracious, but, um, and she, she was just very happy walking people home at night if they'd had too much to drink. And I, I learned what church was about in the John Sands, that um, it's, a, it's an all-inclusive place, and God's family is all-inclusive. Every background, every shape, size, whatever the problems are, um, God welcomes us. And that 
that's what I learned as I, I watched my parents. And that's what I've always wanted, really, uh, that our faith would be something that is all-inclusive of, of all people. That I believe Jesus came and uh, lived and died and rose again for all of us. Whatever we've done, whatever the situation is, he loves us. I, I broke my neck some years ago in a car crash on the way back from here. Um, and I was lying in the hospital, it was before they operated on me. And um, they said I could be paralyzed from my neck down. And um, as I lay there, knowing that if I moved, I could paralyze myself, um, I felt God say to you, me, if you never move again, if you never do anything again for me, I can't love you more than I do today. And it came, it, I came to see that God loves us because he loves us. We don't earn it. It's not anything to do with who we are except that he loves us. And it's his greatest joy to show us his love. And he longs for us to bring that love to others. Uh, quite recently, uh, two friends of mine have died. Uh, one rang me in the summer, and she said, can I come and see you? And uh, we met for breakfast, and we had the most amazing breakfast together. I had known her since I was four, she was a bit older than me, and she'd been one of those people you look up to, you know, when you're small and you, you, you think, I'd love to be like that. She was an artist. And as we uh, talked over breakfast, she told me, that she had found faith in Jesus and that um, she'd had this amazing revelation that Jesus had died for her and had taken everything that blocked the way to a relationship with God. And um, she understood that resurrection life and it had been such a joy to her and had completely transformed her life. About a week ago, I heard that she died in her sleep. She um, had had cancer for only 10 days that they knew about. And um, she had died very peacefully. She had been very happy and fulfilled in these last years. Another friend of mine died um, very suddenly. Uh, he had done many wonderful things. Um, I don't know whether he knew Jesus. I don't know whether he had eternal life. I was quite clear that it's by faith in Jesus that we have eternal life. I went to see a great friend of mine uh, who was rather like a father to me and he was dying of cancer. And as we <coughs> talked about death, he said to me, Ginny, I'm not frightened of dying. Because, and this is why I had up that first up, if we may have it. He said, Jesus has said to me, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And I'd never, I'd read that verse many times. But I hadn't understood that when we put our trust in Jesus, our spirit is born again and that spirit will never die. The you that has been born again goes to heaven. Michael, the Michael, the spirit of Michael that I knew, went straight to heaven. His body died, but he went straight to heaven. And over the years, I've come across many of us who are very frightened of dying. I think um, it may be my age, but I'm not sure that it is, honestly, because I've had many young friends who died 
who've either committed suicide or have died of illness or car crashes. Do we know where we're going? Recently I've been reading a lot about Edith Cavill. I don't know if you know about her. She was born at Swanston near Norwich. She's buried in uh, Norwich Cathedral. And it's her centenary in October 2015. She was a nurse and she felt called by God when asked to go out to Belgium to start a hospital, training hospital. And um, sometime after setting up this hospital and training centre for nurses, um, Belgium, as you know, was uh, invaded and occupied. And soon after that, she would have seen posters saying that if anyone uh, helped prisoners uh, of war or um, people who were not Germans, that they would be shot. And um, she uh, nursed 200 soldiers in the basement of the hospital, unknown to any of the other nurses, and helped get them out uh, to escape. She was part of the resistance. She did this until she was discovered and she was shot. After the war, she was brought back and had a state funeral. She lived with death every day. I think sometimes we forget that death is something that may come our way any day. So I lay in hospital with my broken neck. I knew that I could die at any moment. Are we aware that death can happen at any time? I think so often we just live life, don't we? She lived life, Edith Cavill lived life to the full every day. And that's what I want to do. I, I don't know, we don't know how long we'll live here. But I believe God wants us to live in that fullness every day. A distinctly, distinctively different life. In that resurrection life. Many years ago, as uh, we, you know, I trained as an opera singer. I was at the Royal College of Music and then went out to Rome. As when I got to the college, um, many people said you would miss out if you were a Christian. And so I laid my faith aside and really got into quite a muddle. And wonderfully, uh, some Christian friends asked me to share a flat with them. I'd been thrown out of my own flat on a drugs and brothel charge, which wasn't totally applicable, but that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, then um, the girl I shared a room read to me from the sermons from Solitary Confinement by Richard Brumbrandt, who was a Romanian pastor who was in prison for his faith for 30 years in solitary confinement. And um, I remember listening to her reading and thinking, what has he got that would send him to prison? What is it about his faith that I haven't got? And I remember kneeling down beside my bed with my bottle of whiskey, which I needed for the morning, with my cigarettes, covered in eczema, which was raw, all my arms and legs were raw, my back was raw, and just saying, if, you're, if you exist, I don't know whether you do, but if you exist, will you come into my life? Will you forgive me? I don't know whether what I've done, but I know I've lived in independence from you. And I got into bed. And I woke up the next morning, and I had no eczema at all. The whole of my body had been completely healed. And I knew I didn't need to drink again. And um, I remember getting out of bed, being absolutely amazed by my skin, which had been a huge embarrassment to me. And, and also 
being aware that I didn't need to drink, didn't need to think, that I had this extraordinary peace within me. I had discovered the resurrection, the resurrected Jesus. I wonder just for a moment if you could think, just imagine the two where Jesus was laid. If you can imagine that great big step that was rolled over the two and sealed the two. If you could imagine the women in the early morning, just before dawn, on their way with their spices and ointments to anoint the body of Jesus. To them, that stone represented the end of a dream. It represented extraordinary, excruciating grief. They had seen the one they believed to be the Son of God crucified. They had seen him abandoned. They had heard him cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That stone represented the end of a dream, the end of life. And as they went, they said to one another, who will roll away the stone? And when they got to the tomb, as you know, there was no stone. It had been rolled away. Jesus had risen. That stone to the authorities represented the end of a challenge to their authority. To Jesus, it had represented the breaking of the relationship between him and his father. Why have you forsaken me? That question, where was God? Jesus hung on the cross. That total abandonment, the taking of the full weight of our sin. Jesus had overcome death. He had taken on himself all that separated us from God. Are we living that resurrection life? Or are there for us things that keep us in the tomb? Are there those heavy weights in our lives as we look back that stop us living the resurrection life, living distinctly, differently? I think for many of us, and I know there have been for me at times uh, difficulties with unforgiveness. I remember uh, being accused of something many years ago. I took the blame. I thought I was at fault. And because the person who blamed me was a Christian leader, I thought God didn't forgive. For many Many months I lived in the blackest of depression because I believed God didn't forgive. It was like a weight in my life. I think for some of us, we've been let down by the Christians. Again, I was. Somebody broke a confidence in my life. It led to unbelievable consequences. Again, I very nearly took my life during that time. I find it terribly difficult to forgive her. I battled for many years. 
and Christians who had seen the God to forgive. And I couldn't get there. For some of us, it's grief. And I think for many of us, we walk through those times in our lives where grief is very heavy. It's different for each of us. It may be a broken relationship. Maybe, you know. But I believe God tonight wants to roll the stone away from our lives. We may have failed ourselves. We may have let ourselves down and live with a sense of guilt. Would we ever, ever be able to be used by God again? God is the resurrection God. He is the one who rules the stone away. And I wonder just for a moment, if we could have a moment's quietness. We might want to close our eyes for a second. may be totally irrelevant for you, but it may be that you come with something in your life that is that weight, that stone, that makes living a resurrection life difficult, that weighs you down, that wakes you sometimes in the night. opened the way to life and life in all its fullness. 